Chapter 12. The Going back to our assessment pyramid. We've already done the scene size up. We know what's what we're getting ourselves into and we're, that we're safe doing it. We have all the resources. So the next thing we need to do is identify the critical things we're going to deal with on our patient. So the things that are going to kill them now if we don't fix it. Simple simple uh, acronym to remember, ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. And then your question is, how bad? So approach the patient, you look for ABCs, look for life threats. Airway, is it open or not? If it's open, can they maintain it? Can they keep it open on their own? Is there anything you can do to make it open better that would save their life? So think about what the possibilities are. Uh, breathing, we're looking, are they breathing or not? If they are breathing, is it adequate? And circulation, do they have it? If they don't, fix it. If they have circulation, is it doing what it's supposed to? So we're going to look at we, these aren't sequential. They don't have to be done airway, breathing, then circulation because you're usually with two people in a, uh, a response team. So you can do airway, breathing, and circulation all at once. And you're gonna, you might see something you can stop right now, like bleeding. You can stop that immediately and then maintain the airway. So it kind of depends on your personal judgment for your patient. So... Um, Something we've learned through the military is CAB works great. Stop the bleeding, then worry about airway, then breathing. Only do the interventions that are going to save their life. Some things are nice to do, like putting a Band-Aid on their knee. That's not going to save their life. Putting the tourniquet on their thigh will save their life. Vomit in the airway, got to get that out. If they breathe it in, it causes tissue damage inside the lungs and causes you more problems. Uh, immediate bleeding, tourniquets, put one tourniquet on each extremity, tighten it up, and call it good. Then you don't have to worry about bleeding on any of the extremities the rest of the transport with your patient. Uh, make sure the patient's breathing. If they're not breathing, breathe for them. We know how to do that. Bleeding control, CPR. Sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't, and it depends on your patient. So you're going to do uh, some quick, quick assessments there. Look for the signs and symptoms of shock. Are they having any issues that cause you to concern that they're not perfusing adequately? So the first thing we do when we walk up to a patient is we get our general impression. If you are shocked that they're still alive, that's a poor general impression. That means something is wrong. You get that sixth sense that says something is not right with this patient. You make them a high priority patient and call it good. Next thing we do is after we get our general impression is get the mental status. Then we go to airway, breathing, circulation. Once we get all these things put together, we can determine whether our patient needs to go to the hospital now, really soon, or sometime. And those are our priorities here. So critical patients, go now. Not so critical sometime soon and then the ones that just need to get to the, a ride to the hospital we take them to the hospital so your general impression is their chief complaint we've we've asked them what happened why they called if they can't tell us what's your your uh, guess based on the mechanism what do you see from the patient if there's any problems with abcs that's a general impression that's going to tell you that's a bad patient so looking at this kid, you can get a general impression. She uh, lost a roller skate. She fell down, hit her knee, hit her head. But you can look at her and tell she's conscious. She's sitting up. She's breathing okay. And she's probably not a high priority. So your first general impression is not too bad. If you think anything in the mechanism caused any spinal issues, then we're going to go to the spinal motion restrictions. And that's as simple as having somebody hold their head while you talk to them. If they're unresponsive, you hold the head. If they're responsive, tell them what you're doing and hold their head. But somewhere along the line, you're going to make some decisions. Do you need to continue this? 
So head in line uh, stabilization. Use your local guidelines. We'll talk about the nexus guidelines when we get to spinal trauma. That'll help you determine whether we go any further. But for your primary assessment, you're not going to have the time to make those decisions. So hold the head still if you think there's any potential. And we'll worry about that as soon as we get the ABCs taken care of. So look at your patient. If you see anything that looks bad, treat them as if they're a bad patient. You can see if people are lifeless, they need the AED applied to them. They're not moving, they're, you do a, a, some type of stimulation, advan uh, painful stimulation, they don't move. You know they've got uh, some problems going on. You check a pulse, there's no pulse, start CPR. If they're anxious, sweaty, pale, you know there's some type of hypoperfusion or something else going on. Normal people, stable patients will be able to talk to you and have a conversation and know what's going on around them. The unstable or the ones that are not uh, that are not going to be uh, the simple patients, the more critical ones, they're going to have issues. Look for obvious trauma to the core of the body. Head, neck chest, abdomen, pelvis. Look at their uh, body positions. If they're sitting with their hands on their knees or they've got their ch uh, hand across their chest, all signs there's a problem going on there. So th you can get some general impressions based on that. If they say abdominal pain, that's a little bit specific, but you can ask them where and tell them to point. Or they might be, uh, I don't feel good, but I don't know what's going on. Either one of these could be bad. So you're going to have to make some judgment calls. If you make a judgment call and you think the patient's more critical than they really are, that's okay. If you make a judgment call and you don't think they're as critical as they are, that's when we have problems. So we need to make those be a little err on the side of being more protective for you. You're also looking at the age, gender, the body position. Listen to what they're ta how they're talking to you, how they're making noises, any extra noises you're not identifying, and then smells. Do you smell anything that shouldn't be there? Any chemical odors, uh, any uh, urine, feces, vomit, or decaying tissue. Sometimes we have pa patients that have uh, gangrene, and you can smell the rotting tissue on them. So those are things that catch your uh, nose and give you a clue there's something might be wrong. After we got that general impression, we're going to move into our AFPU, our assessment of the mental status. So the simple process here is you talk to them, they talk to you back. If they're making sense, they know who they are, where they are, and what's going on around them, they're alert and oriented. You may hear it alert oriented times person, place, and thing, or time. Uh, or AOA or AAO times three or CAO times three. That just means they know who they are, where they're at, and approximate time of day. They don't have to know the exact time, but do they know it's day or night? Do they know it's summer, winter? Something like that. If they will talk to you when you talk to them, or they look at you when you talk to them, or they do some type of response to a verbal stimuli, that's what you document it as. They are alert to verbal stimuli. Document what kind of response they had. So if I talk to them and I say, hey, I'm, I'm here to help you, and they say, pretty blue skies, and you say, what's your name? And they say, blue skies. That's a response to verbal stimuli, but it's not oriented. So it's a uh, altered mental status with disorientation to a verbal response. If they say, you, you say, hey, I'm here to help, and they look at you, but they don't respond, they don't verbally respond, you just document, respond to the verbal stimuli with a, a, a stare. Painful stimuli, quick, quickest, easiest way to do painful stimuli is take your pen on the back of the thumb, squeeze down, and put the pressure on the nail bed, and that will create enough painful stimuli they will uh, wake up if they are not... Uh, unresponsive. You also may see them do uh, trapezius squeezes, OPAs are pain painful stimuli, so if you get the reaction to that. But again, with this, if you do a painful stimuli, document 
what the stimuli was and what kind of response they gave. Did they grab your hand and push it away? Did they flex their muscles? Did they extend their muscles? If they don't respond to any of that, mark them down as unresponsive. So we've got AVPU, A-V-P-U. Remember that acronym. It comes up a lot here for you. You order your primary assessment kind of depends on what you find. Uh, we typically start airway breathing circulation, but if something needs more attention, you put your focus on that. So if they're bleeding, you stop the bleeding. Uh, if you know they're not breathing, you may try to breathe for them and uh, open the airway at the same time. So use all your tools, all your skills, and put a piece together that's going to work for that pet, that particular patient. So when you walk in, you start looking around, seeing what's on, what's uh, happening with your patient. So this patient's supine on the floor. Is he breathing or not? Question you're going to ask. If he's not breathing, then we need to make sure the airway's open. If their airway's open and he's still not breathing, then we breathe for them. And so on and so on. So look, you can check a pulse at the same time you're checking breathing. So you've got several things you can be doing at once. You're also scanning the whole body to see if there's any major bleeding. And you can check the skin temperature and color while you're checking pulses. So you're doing a lot of things at once. For practical purposes, we're going to identify step by step so we know that we are understanding everything. But for real patients, you're going to do it uh, kind of simultaneously. So airway, if they're talking to you, if they're crying, if they're a kid, airway's open. If they can make noise... They've got an airway. If they're making gurgling noises or snoring noises, then we know there's other issues we've got. But check the airway. Is it open? If it's not, open it. Make sure it stays open. If they're breathing, if they're not breathing, check to see if they have a pulse. If they don't have a pulse, then we do CPR. If they are breathing or they do have a pulse but no breathing, we have to breathe for them once every six to eight seconds. Is the breathing adequate? If they're unresponsive, it's probably not adequate. Or they wouldn't be unresponsive. So try to figure out what we need to do. Do they need oxygen? Do they need breathing assistance? Skin or uh, circulation. Remember, perfusion is the uh, oxygen getting to the end organ. The skin is our largest organ. So if it's pink, warm, and dry, they've got good perfusion. If it's not, if it's cool, clammy, moist, pale, uh, cyanotic, that's signs of hypoperfusion or shock. So that's a quick assessment of the circulation. We also check for pulses. Pulse check no longer than 10 seconds for circulation. If we're checking a pulse for vital signs, it's going to be 30 seconds. But for circulation, 10 seconds. So three things on a pulse. It's either there or not. And we're also looking for where. If we find it carotid but not radius, we know there's a problem and they're not perfusing all the way to the end of the organ. Uh, if it's normal pace, nor, uh, 60 to 100, we know we're okay. If it's too high or too slow, we know they've got problems. We also look for ble uh, bleeding. We're circulating blood. That's what keeps us perfused. If it's not in the inside of the vas vascular system, we have problems. External bleeding, we put direct pressure. Put a tourniquet on. If we don't have, uh, if we have internal bleeding, we call them a critical patient. So we get them to the hospital where they can actually stop the bleeding. So if you've done anything in the primary assessment, if you fix the airway, breathing, or circulation. They're natural, automatically a high priority. If the mechanism tells you they should be worse off than they appear, they're a high priority. Or if you've got that funny feeling that something's not right, they're a high priority. So always go a little bit more aggressive on the treatment. Make them a higher priority than you think they need and get them the treatment they need just in case. Here's the, the ultimate high priority patient. You're doing CPR, you're putting a defibrillator on, that would be a high priority patient. 
but this is a little different because we are not transporting cardiac arrest as rapidly as others. Uh, we're going to do a few things on scene because we can do things that almost identical to what the hospital does. Sometimes we're not sure what's wrong with the patient or uh, they fool us a little bit. We think they're a lower priority and they change on us. That's okay. If they change priorities, just change what you're telling the hospital and get them there then the time frame you think they need. If you can't stop something that's causing problems with ABCs, keep keep working on it and transport to the hospital. There have been patients that I've worked the whole 45 minute transport time to secure an airway. We had other people doing other things, but I was focused on the airway because that's that's a priority. So you can't leave ABCs until you get them taken care of. If you start doing CPR, you don't really care about the uh, abrasions on the rest of the body. So you need to make sure you take care of the ABCs first. Why do we continue to reassess the primary? Because they change on us. Anytime the patient's condition changes, better or worse, you want to go back and check the ABCs. If they go unresponsive, go back and check to see if they've got airway breathing circulation. If they wake up, check the airway to make sure it's still secured, make sure they're breathing okay, make sure they've got a good pulse. This is a, another thing we need to think about is if a child does not know person, place, or time, is that a bad thing? Do babies know their name? Some adults don't know their name. So use a little judgment, use your professional judgment to kind of figure out what they, what kind of mental status they should have or whether uh, they're trying to compensate and try to fool you like kids will do. So depending on a medical trauma, you, you're going to do a few things differently, but always focus on ABCs. Always pay attention to what could kill the patient and get the job done. And we're going to practice these a lot during class, so you'll have plenty of opportunities. As always, if you have questions, write them down, bring them to class. Thanks, and have a great day.